Category O, Lecture 4, Structure of Verma Modules. Let's start with briefly recalling the setup of the previous lectures. So we work with a semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebra G with a fixed triangular decomposition G is equal to n minus plus H plus n plus. So here H is a fixed Cartan subalgebra which leads to a root system in the dual space. And when we choose the basis of this root system, the root system decomposes into the positive and negative roots. And so n plus is the subalgebra given by the direct sum of root spaces corresponding to positive roots. And n minus is a subalgebra given by the direct sum of root subspaces corresponding to the negative roots. In the easiest example of the algebra SLM, we can think of H as the algebra of diagonal matrices, N plus the algebra of strictly upper triangular matrices, and N minus as the algebra of strictly lower triangular matrices. We denote by W the while group of the root system phi, which is a group of linear operators on the dual space H star, which is generated by all reflections with respect to all roots. And uh, the group W acts on H star in the natural way. It is defined as the group of certain linear operators on H star. And also it acts on H star via the so-called dot action. So this is the action which is shifted from the classical action or from the usual action by the one half of the sum of all positive roots denoted by rho. So this is just like the usual action but with the origin shifted to minus rho. So elements of H star are called weights. So fixing lambda a weight we can consider the corresponding one-dimensional H module on which elements of H act via scalars prescribed by lambda. So H acts on V as the scalar lambda of H times V for any H in H and any vector V in C lambda. So every simple H module has the form C lambda for some lambda in H star. Further, if we set that n plus c lambda is equal to zero, then we define on c lambda the structure of a module over the Borel subalgebra h plus n plus of g. And the corresponding Verma module delta of lambda is defined as the ug module obtained from c lambda using the induction. So we take the Borel module c lambda and induce it from the universal enveloping algebra of the Borel subalgebra all the way up to G. And we know from the previous lectures that the Verma module delta of lambda has central character chi lambda, which means that elements of the center of the universal enveloping algebra act on delta lambda via scalars, and these scalars are prescribed by the algebra homomorphism denoted chi lambda from the center of the universal enveloping algebra to C. And we also have proved the theorem that chi lambda is equal to chi mu if and only if lambda belongs to the row orbit of mu with respect to the dot action of the vial group. Further, in the proof of this theorem, we use the following observation that if the weight lambda is such that its evaluation at the Cartan element H alpha, so this is the element belonging to the SL2 subalgebra of G corresponding to the root alpha, where alpha is a simple root. So if lambda of H alpha is a non-negative integer, then there is a non-zero homomorphism from the Verma module corresponding to the weight S alpha dot lambda to the Verma module corresponding to the weight lambda. So let us start today with classification of simple finite dimensional G modules. So recall that the Verma module delta lambda has unique simple quotient, which we denote by L lambda. 
So the main theorem for classification of simple finite dimensional modules is that the module L of lambda is finite dimensional if and only if the evaluation of lambda at each h alpha, where alpha is a simple root, is a non-negative integer. Note that any simple finite dimensional module is a weight module because it must contain a weight vector by finite dimensionality. Any module generated by a weight vector is a weight module. So it is a weight module, and since, since it's finite dimensional, it must have a highest weight. So any simple finite dimensional module is a highest weight module, so it is isomorphic to some L of lambda, and this theorem states that L of lambda is finite dimensional if and only if this integrality condition is satisfied. Therefore, the theorem provides a classification of all simple finite dimensional G modules. Note that we already established that different L lambdas are not isomorphic. So let's start with proving the only if part of this statement. So assume that the evaluation of lambda at some h alpha is not a non-negative integer for some simple root alpha. Denote by v lambda the canonical generator of the Verma module delta lambda. And consider the SL2 subalgebra of G corresponding to the root alpha. So it is spent by vectors E alpha, so this is a root element of G for the root alpha, the element F alpha, so this is a root element for G for the root minus alpha, and the element H alpha, so this is a Cartan element, which is the uh, Lie bracket of E alpha and F alpha. Consider now the linear span inside delta lambda of all elements of the form f alpha to some power applied to the canonical generator v lambda, where power is allowed to be a non-negative integer. From the definition, it is easy to see that this vector space is actually a Verma module over our SL2 subalgebra. Because of our assumption that lambda of h alpha is not a non-negative integer, this module is simple. This is because we already saw the simplicity criterion for Verma modules over SL2. They are simple exactly under this assumption. And since this module is simple, it means that any non-zero element of this module can be moved to the canonical generator v lambda using the action of the SL2 algebra SL2 alpha. In particular, any element of this module generates our Verma module delta lambda. Therefore, the unique maximal submodule of delta lambda must avoid this module n. But this n is infinite dimensional, which means that L lambda must be infinite dimensional in this case. So this proves the only if part of the theorem. Before we can prove the if part, we have to discuss homomorphisms between Verma modules. The first claim is that any non-zero homomorphism between Verma modules is injective. To prove this, let us recall that any Verma module is isomorphic to the universal enveloping algebra of the negative part of G as a vector space, and even as a module over this universal enveloping algebra. So the isomorphism is given by sending an element u from this universal enveloping algebra to the image of the canonical generator of delta lambda under the action of the element u. Now assume that we have a homomorphism phi from delta lambda to delta mu, and that this homomorphism sends the canonical generator v lambda of delta lambda to the element u v mu of delta mu. So here, u is a non-zero element of the universal enveloping algebra of u n minus. Because of the previous discussion, any homomorphism from delta lambda to delta mu must have such a form. Now let's note that the universal enveloping algebra of a finite dimensional V algebra is a domain. So this is because it's a filtered algebra and the associated graded algebra is just a polynomial algebra, which is a domain. So u of n minus is a domain, 
Therefore, if we take any element A in U of n minus and try to calculate the image of the element A times V lambda under our homomorphism phi, we get the following. So since phi is a homomorphism, we can move A out and get A times phi of V lambda. Now, phi of V lambda, as we discussed, is equal to U times V mu, so we get A times U times V mu. And this is a non-zero element because U of n minus is a domain, and so A times U should be a non-zero element. So this implies exactly that phi is an injective map. Next, let us discuss the quotient of the module delta lambda by the submodule isomorphic to delta of S alpha dot lambda. So assume that lambda of H alpha is a non-negative integer for some simple root alpha. Then we have already mentioned that there is a non-zero homomorphism from delta of S alpha dot lambda to delta of lambda. And from the previous slide, we know that this homomorphism should be injective. So let's consider delta S alpha dot lambda as a submodule of delta of lambda and denote by N alpha the corresponding co-kernel. So the quotient of delta of lambda by delta of S alpha dot lambda. We claim that for any weight nu in H star, the dimension of the new weight space in N alpha is equal to the dimension of S alpha of nu weight space in N alpha. So here, this is a usual action of W, not the dot action. In other words, the character of N alpha is invariant under the action of the simple reflection S alpha. To prove this claim, consider the parabolic subalgebra P alpha of G, which is given by adding the root subspace G minus alpha to the Borel subalgebra H plus N plus. Using the associativity of induction, we can view the Verma module delta of lambda, which is defined as the module induced from the one-dimensional module over the Borel, all the way to U of G, as the module which is obtained by a two-step induction. So we start with our module C lambda, first induce it to our parabolic subalgebra P alpha, and only then induce it to the whole of U of G. So this can be done because the induction is associated. Now we can note that the first induction produces a Verma module over the subalgebra SL2 alpha associated to our root alpha. And from the poincare birgovic theorem, we know that both inductions are exact because the universe enveloping algebra of Lie algebra is free as a module over the universe enveloping algebra of any its subalgebra. As a consequence, it follows that we can view the module N of alpha as the module induced from a finite dimensional SL2 alpha module Q considered as a module over our parabolic subalgebra P alpha all the way up to U of G. So this is because in the first step of the induction, we have a Verma module over SL2, which due to the conditions that lambda of H alpha is a non-negative integer has a submodule. So if you take the quotient, then the module N of alpha is exactly the module induced from that quotient. Next, let us recall that the adjoint action of the Lie algebra on the universe enveloping algebra is locally finite. So if we want to understand this induced module N alpha as a module over our SL2 subalgebra SL2 alpha, we should act with elements from SL2 on the left, use the adjoint action to move them to the tensor product, and then move them over the tensor product. But when we use the adjoint action, we know that this adjoint action is locally finite. Therefore, the module N alpha will certainly be a submodule into a huge direct sum over certain finite dimensional modules, namely those which you can find as in the adjoint action of SL2 alpha on U of G, tensored with the module we induce from, the module Q, 
Uh, but Q is a finite dimensional module and V is a finite dimensional module. So this means that N of alpha is actually a direct sum, possibly an infinite direct sum, but it is a direct sum of finite dimensional SL2 alpha modules. And for each finite dimensional module, it follows from the SL2 theory that their support is invariant with respect to the simple reflection S alpha. So this proves the claim of our lemma. Now we are ready to prove the if part of the theorem which classifies simple finite dimensional G modules. What we need to prove, we need to prove that in the case when for any simple root alpha, the evaluation of lambda at H alpha is a non-negative integer, then the dimension of the module L of lambda is finite. To prove this, we know that for any simple root alpha, N of alpha clearly surjects onto L of alpha. Therefore, it follows from the previous slide that the character of L of alpha is invariant with respect to the action of the simple reflection S alpha. But now this holds for any simple root alpha. This means that the character of L of lambda is invariant under the action of the Weyl group, because the Weyl group is generated by simple reflections. However, at the same time, the support of the module L of lambda has only finitely many weights in the dominant Weyl chamber. So this is because the support of this module belongs to the support of the Verma module, and Verma module has a support which starts from lambda and then goes into the direction of negative roots, while the dominant wild chamber is a cone which goes into the direction of positive roots. So if you take a cone going into the direction of negative roots and the cone going in, into the direction of positive roots, the intersection is a bounded region. And the weight lattice is a discrete lattice, so it will have only finitely many points in that intersection. Taking also into account that each weight space of L lambda is finite dimensional, this is because this is true for Verma modules, already Verma module, any Verma module is a weight module with finite dimensional weight spaces. So we have only finitely many weights and each weight space is finite dimensional. It follows that the module L of lambda is finite dimensional. And in this way, we have the classification of all simple finite dimensional G modules. These are exactly the simple highest weight modules, where the highest weight has the property that its evaluation at each element H alpha, where alpha is a simple root, is a non-negative integer. Let's discuss further structure of the Verma module delta of lambda. Recall that any object in category O has finite lengths. We established this in the previous lecture. It follows that the Verma module, which is an object in O, also has a finite length. Theorem, each simple subquotient of delta lambda is isomorphic to the simple highest weight module L mu, where mu is some element from the orbit of lambda under the dot action of the Weyl group. W. To prove this, we note that each simple subquotient of delta lambda is a weight module, of course, and it has support, which is a subset of the support of delta lambda. And so it has a highest weight, because the support of delta of lambda has a highest weight. So it, from our classification of simple highest weight modules, it follows that this L is of the form L of mu for some mu in H star, and being a simple subquotient of delta of lambda, L of mu must have the same central character as delta of lambda, and from the Harishian Ra theorem, we deduce that mu belongs to the orbit of lambda under the dot action of the Weyl group. Next claim is that any Verma module has simple socle. So it has finite length, so it has a well defined. Sokol as the maximal semi-simple submodule, and the claim is that the Sokol is actually simple. The easiest way to prove this is to use the fact that the universe enveloping algebra of n minus 
is a domain of finite gilfand kirillov dimension. So this dimension is a dimension of n minus. From this, it follows directly that any two non-zero u n minus submodules of u n minus have non-zero intersection. So we have uh, a domain of finite gilfand kirillov dimension. Uh, then any left ideal should have at least the same gilfand kirillov dimension. This is given by some polynomial growth, and because of the domain condition, also the highest term of the polynomial should be the same. So there is simply no space there for two disjoint left ideals, because then you would have the same polynomial growth, but the highest term coefficient must be doubled. So from this consideration of gilfand kirillov dimension, it follows that any two non-zero left ideals in u n minus have non-zero intersection. But any submodule of Verma module is in particular a left u n minus ideal. So any two submodules should have a non-zero intersection, which exactly means that delta of lambda has a unique semi-simple submodule, which is actually simple. Okay, the next statement is that the dimension of the homomorphism space between Verma modules is at most one. So we already know that any homomorphism between Verma modules is injective. So this means that any non-zero homomorphism maps the simple socle of the original Verma module delta lambda to the simple socle of the target Verma module delta mu. By Schurz lemma, we know that the socle of delta mu, which is a simple module, that it only has scalar endomorphisms. Therefore, if the dimension of the home space from delta lambda to delta mu would be at least two, we would be able to form a linear combination of these homomorphisms, which would have killed the socle of the original module delta lambda, because the socle has one dimensional space of endomorphisms, and if we have a two linearly independent homomorphism, we can form a linear combination which kills the socle. But that would contradict the injectivity of homomorphisms from delta lambda of delta mu. Then this linear combination would be a non injective homomorphism from delta lambda to delta mu. And so it must be zero, a contradiction. From the considerations above, it also follows that the socle of delta lambda has multiplicity 1 in delta lambda. Again, the socle has a free u n minus submodule. This is because u of n minus is a domain, and hence the same gilfand kirillov dimension as u n minus. When we factor it out, the gilfand kirillov dimension of the quotient must decrease, because we have the same gilfand kirillov dimension and also the same leading coefficient. So they cancel out, and the gilfand kirillov dimension of the quotient of Verma module by any submodule is strictly smaller. And so there is no place there for any second copy of the socle. Recall that we have called a weight integral, provided that its evaluation at any h alpha, where alpha is a simple root, is an integer. And from the above, it follows that L of lambda is finite dimensional if and only if it is integral, dominant, and regular. So dominant means that it belongs to the dominant wild chamber, a regular means that uh, its uh, dot stabilizer is trivial. Let us fix a reduced expression of some element W in W. So we write W in the shortest possible way as a product of simple reflections. And for any j from 1 to k, where k is the length of w, we denote by wj the suffix of w of length j. So this is the product s alpha j, s alpha j minus 1, all the way to s alpha 1. So this is the last part of w, which starts from s alpha j. The claim is that for an integral dominant and regular weight lambda, we have a sequence of embeddings. Delta lambda has a submodule which is isomorphic to delta of w1 dot lambda. So w1 is exactly s of alpha 1. So this one has a submodule which is isomorphic to delta w2 dot lambda. So we apply 
S alpha 2 to S alpha 1 dot lambda, and so on all the way down to delta of W dot lambda. Of course, in order to prove this, we only need to prove that at each individual step we have that delta W j plus 1 dot lambda is a submodule in delta W j dot lambda. And for this step, we know that W j plus 1 dot lambda is obtained from W j dot lambda by using the simple reflection S of alpha j plus 1, and that the evaluation of the weight W j dot lambda at H alpha j plus 1 is a non-negative integer. So we can use what we have seen in the previous lectures, that if you start from a weight and you apply the dot action of a reflection with respect to the simple root, under the condition that this evaluation is a non-negative integer, you get a non-zero homomorphism, which gives us a submodule because any non-zero homomorphism between Verma modules is an embedding. One consequence from this is that for an integral dominant and regular lambda, the Verma module delta W dot lambda is a submodule of delta of lambda for any element W in W. What we are going to discuss next, we are going to discuss which Verma modules are submodules of other Verma modules. So on this slide, we have concluded that if we have a dominant and regular lambda, then all potential Verma submodules and the potential ones are those with the same central character, so these are exactly delta w dot lambda. So we have already established that for integral dominant and regular lambda, all other potential Verma submodules of delta lambda are indeed Verma submodules of it. Let's consider the following SL3 example. Consider the algebra SL3 and let lambda be the zero weight. The while group W is a symmetric group S3. It has six elements, E, and then two simple reflections S and T, and then their products ST and TS, and the longest element W0, which is equal to STS or TST. And the previous slide gives us the following embeddings. The Verma module delta 0 has delta T.0 as a submodule. This one has delta ST.0 as a submodule and this one has delta W0.0 .0 as a submodule. This is because we can write W0 as TST, so we have T, ST, and TST here. Similarly, if we write W0 as STS, so we have the delta of 0 has delta S.0 as a submodule, this one has delta TS.0 as a submodule, and this one has delta W.0 as a submodule. We can look at the support picture for the Verma module delta of zero. So this is a support picture for delta of zero. The highest weight is zero, and we are allowed to go in the direction of negative roots, minus alpha and minus beta. So the support consists of zero, minus alpha, minus two alpha, minus beta, minus alpha, minus beta, minus two alpha, minus beta, and so on. And the purple color here on the support are the elements in the orbit of zero with respect to the dot action of W. And so we have here that we know that in delta zero, S dot zero is a submodule, and then TS dot zero is a submodule here, and W zero dot zero is a submodule here. So we have this zigzag of weights given us submodules. Similarly, in zero, T0 is a submodule, ST.0 is a submodule, and W0.0 .0 is a submodule. We have the second zigzag. And from the picture, we see that we also have potentially the highest weight of ST.0. So the weight itself belongs to the support of the Verma module with highest weight S.0. So it's a natural question to ask whether delta ST.0 is a submodule of delta S.0. Similarly, whether the delta of TS.0 is a submodule of delta T.0. So these are two natural questions which we haven't answered yet, but they are natural to ask. So the question which we now have to think about are, do we have these embeddings that delta ST.0 is a submodule of delta S.0, and similarly, delta TS.0, whether it is a submodule of delta T.0. 
So we claim that the answer is yes, and that delta st dot zero is a submodule of delta s dot zero. So the other case is the same by symmetry. So let us compare the weight space multiplicities for the Verma module delta zero and the Verma submodule delta s dot zero. The Verma module delta zero has the dimensions of the weight spaces one on the boundary, then two on the first line where you shift the boundary by minus alpha minus beta, then three on the next shift, four on the next shift, and so on. Similarly, the module delta s dot zero, it has dimensions one on its boundary, two on the next shift to the boundary, three on the next shift to the boundary, and so on. And if we look at the weight space, which corresponds to the weight st dot zero, we see that both modules have dimension two at this weight space. So both delta s dot zero and delta zero have dimension two at the weight minus beta minus two alpha, which is st dot zero. Consequence, the weight space of delta s dot zero of the weight minus beta minus two alpha is equal to the weight space of delta of zero at the weight minus beta minus two alpha. And we know that delta st dot zero is a submodule of delta zero, so there is a highest weight vector at this weight space st dot zero. So it follows that this highest weight vector must already be a highest weight vector inside the Verma module delta s dot zero. In other words, the delta st dot zero is a submodule of delta s dot zero. So here we can now formulate a general statement. We know that st dot zero can be obtained from s dot zero by acting with the element sts. So sts times s is exactly st. And the element sts is exactly the reflection with respect to the root alpha plus beta, which is a positive root, but it's not a simple root. So claim, assume that we have a positive root alpha and an element lambda, a weight lambda in H star, such that lambda of H alpha is a non-negative integer, or equivalently as alpha of lambda is strictly smaller than lambda in our partial order of weights. In other words, as, lambda, as alpha dot lambda can be obtained from lambda by subtracting the positive root alpha maybe several times. The claim under these assumptions, the Verma module delta s alpha dot lambda is a submodule of the Verma module delta of lambda. The idea of the proof so if we fix a positive integer n, one can show that the set of all weights lambda, such that the Verma module delta lambda minus n alpha is a submodule of delta lambda, is the risky closed in H star. So this is because if you fix n, then you can use the poincare birgoff witt theorem to write a basis in delta lambda of weight lambda minus n alpha, and then you can write the conditions that some linear combination of these basis elements is a highest weight vector. So this condition can be written in terms of that some polynomials in lambda vanish. Because if you write that some elements from n plus kill that vector, and if, if you do the computation in the Verma module, you arrive at the condition that some polynomials in lambda should vanish. So this shows that this set is the risky closed in H star. And using arguments similar to the ones which we used on the previous slide when we established that delta st dot lambda is a submodule of delta s dot lambda, one can show that under some integrality assumptions on lambda, the claim that delta of lambda minus an alpha is a submodule of delta of lambda is true. And then it remains to observe that the set of those integral weights is the risky dense in the set from step one. And this completes the proof of the proposition. 
For the full details, we refer to section 7.6 of Dick Smear's book. So to write down all the details is quite a kind of long story. So now we are ready to formulate the main result of today's lecture, which is a bernstein gilfand gilfand theorem on the structure of Verman modules. So this theorem is from 1971. In particular, it predates the definition of category O by five years. The main motivation for that theorem is that BGG tried to correct the structure theorem on Verma modules from the original PhD thesis of Verma. So the theorem is as follows. Assume that we have two weights, lambda and mu. Then for these two weights, the following conditions are equivalent. There is a non-zero homomorphism from the Verma module delta mu to the Verma module delta lambda. Condition two is that L of mu is a composition subquotient of delta lambda. And condition three, which is usually called the BGG condition, there exists a sequence of positive roots where repetitions are allowed, such that we can go from lambda to mu via a sequence of reflections. So we can start from lambda, reflect with respect to the first positive root, and we get s alpha 1 dot lambda, this should be strictly smaller than lambda in our order. Then we reflect with respect to the second root, we get s alpha 2 s alpha 1 dot lambda, should again be strictly smaller than s alpha 1 dot lambda in our partial order on weights, and so on. And by a sequence of such reflections, we should be able to reach our weight mu. Note that the fact that 1 implies 2 is really obvious. So if you have a non-zero homomorphism, then the top of delta mu should be a simple subquotient of delta lambda. The claim that 3 implies 1 follows directly from the previous slide. So at each individual reflection, the previous slide says that we get a Verma submodule of a Verma module. A very hard part is to prove that condition 2 implies condition 3. And again, we refer to Dixmia section 7, 6 for full details. The original reference for this theorem is the paper by Bernstein, Gilfand, and Gilfand, which is called Structure of Representations that are Generated by Vectors of Highest Weights from 1971, published in Functional Analysis and its Applications. So let's discuss special cases of the theorem, in particular for regular blocks. So assume that lambda is integral, regular, and dominant. Recall that the Harish-Chandra theorem says that delta mu has the same central character as delta lambda if and only if mu belongs to the orbit of lambda under the dot action of the vial group. So any two Verma modules with the same character as delta lambda can be written as delta x dot lambda and delta y dot lambda, where x and y are two elements in the while group. So therefore, we can now formulate the following corollary from the BGG theorem. For any two elements in the while group, the following conditions are equivalent. There is a non-zero home between the corresponding Verma modules from delta x dot lambda to delta y dot lambda. The simple module Lx dot lambda is a composition subquotient of delta y dot lambda. And the element x is greater than or equal to y with respect to the Bruja order on the while group. This statement follows directly from the BGG theorem on the structure of Verma modules, as soon as one knows that the Bruja order is exactly defined as an order given by that we use reflections with respect to arbitrary positive roots and get elements of higher lengths. So if we start from an element, we reflect with respect to the positive root and get an element which has higher lengths than x, then these two elements are exactly compared in the Bruja order. So BGG condition can be reformulated in this way using the Bruja order on W. Also, the BGG theorem can be used to formulate the following simplicity criterion for Verma modules. So for any lambda in H star, the Verma module delta of lambda is simple, 
if and only if for any positive root alpha, the evaluation of lambda at h alpha is not a non-negative integer. So this follows directly from the BGG condition. In order to reflect with respect to a positive root inside the module, we need exactly this condition to be satisfied that the evaluation of lambda at h alpha is a non-negative integer. So if this condition is not satisfied, then the BGG condition in the theorem says that delta of lambda has no submodules. One consequence of this is, of course, that generic Verma modules are simple. In order to have a non-simple Verma module, you need to find a positive root. So there is a finite set. And for that positive root, you need this condition that evaluation of lambda at this positive root is a non-negative integer. So you have a finite number of countable families of hyperplanes inside H star, which gives us our families of non-simple Verma modules. So generic Verma modules are simple. And of course, this agrees with our SL2 case when we know that the Verma module is simple if and only if uh, the highest weight evaluated at the unique Cartan element is a non-negative integer. So let's look at the SL3 example. So for SL3, we already established that uh, Verma modules in the dot orbit of the weight zero are included in the following way. So delta of zero has everything as a submodule. So delta s dot zero has st dot zero, w zero dot zero, and ts dot zero as a submodules, and so on. So this is exactly the Hasse diagram for the Bruja order on the symmetric group S3. It is very easy to check that all these Verma modules are multiplicity free. And using this, you can derive the explicit formulas for the support of all simple highest weight modules. So we have six simple highest weight modules. Uh, L0, Ls.0, T.0, St.0, Ts.0, and W0.0. All their supports are, of course, subsets of the support of the dominant Verma module delta 0. So this is a support of delta 0. And then you see the dimensions of the corresponding weight spaces for all these modules indicated here. So the module L0 is one dimensional and it's concentrated here in the highest weight. The module Ls.0, so it has highest weight minus alpha, and then all weight spaces of this module are one-dimensional, and its support is concentrated in this region. So Lt.0 similarly has highest weight minus beta, all weight spaces one-dimensional and concentrated in this region. Lst.0, it has highest weight minus beta minus two alpha, all its weight spaces are one-dimensional and they're concentrated in this region. So the Ts dot alpha, this is the highest weight concentrated in this region. All weight spaces are one-dimensional. And Lw0.0, uh, the highest weight is minus 2 alpha minus 2 beta. And this is a Verma module, so its support is concentrated in this region and weight spaces are one-dimensional here, two-dimensional here, three-dimensional here, and so on. Finally, a couple of questions for PhD students. Question number one, prove that the weight is integral if and only if it belongs to the support of some finite dimensional G module. Question number two, assume that lambda is dominant, regular, and integral. Show that the maximal submodule of delta lambda is the sum of all submodules delta s alpha dot lambda, where alpha is a simple root. Question number three. Prove that the Verma module corresponding to the weight minus rho is simple. Question number four. Prove that the socle of a Verma module is a Verma module. Question number five. Construct explicitly an example of a Verma module such that this Verma module is not simple, but at the same time, the evaluation of its highest weight lambda at any h alpha where alpha is a simple root is not a non-negative integer. Thank you very much. See you next week.